Well, good afternoon and welcome to Best Paper session number two. Um, as a courtesy to our presenters, uh, please turn off and silence your cell phones. Um, if you need to leave before the presentation is over, these are being recorded, so I would ask that you don't leave if you don't really have to. But if you do, uh, please use the doors in the back and not the side door. Um, as a reminder also, all conference registrants are eligible to obtain CEU credits uh, for all paper presentations this year. So if you need to do that, please find somebody in a, an operations orange badge and, and they can help you uh, get your credit for your CEUs. And also make sure that you're scanned in, that, that helps as well. So our second paper is out of our uh, Human Performance Committee. Uh, it is entitled Augmented Reality in Tactical Combat Casualty Care, Physiological Ramifications. Our presenter is Claire Hughes. Ms. Hughes is a research associate in the Extended Reality Division at uh, Design Interactive Incorporated. She holds a Master of Science in Human Factors and Systems Engineering from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Hillside College. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Hughes. applications become ever more popular across industry and military training contexts, it's critical for us to um, design and use these immersive platforms with a clear understanding of not only their benefits, but their limitations as well. So Dr. K. Stani and myself and Dr. Fido Piazzas and um, Angelica Jasper embarked upon a research study um, to look into those physiological effects of augmented reality. Thus far in the research cycle, AIR has been shown to uh, produce less overtly incapacitating symptoms than typical, typically are seen with virtual reality. Those being nausea, disorientation. Um, so it's, it's very likely that folks will remain immersed in these augmented reality systems much longer. Um, as we're seeing this rapid adoption across the military, especially in, in light of the IVAS systems that are coming in, um, th the importance of studying these potentially negative effects are, have, have become ever more critical. Um, upwards of 50% of AR participants are expected to experience some degree of cyber sickness upon immediate post-exposure. Um, uh, sample sizes are in the effect sizes are much smaller than VR, um, but they are certainly there. Um, based on the VR data, those, those <clears throat> excuse me, effects are expected to be worse when that AR exposure is long duration, and particularly in this study, we studied a two hour duration. So the aims of the exploratory study to, were to better understand and quantify the differences in potential cyber sickness, including both subjective readings and objective measurements of postural stability after protracted long duration exposure across three AR displays. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about why AR is so important for the future of military and industrial training. Um, particularly in the military context, the ability to train tactical combat casualty care at a CLS level is particularly of concern for the DOD. Um, it's bringing our soldiers home safely um, every single day. And so that's driving a, a big interest in AR training solutions. These solutions can provide hands-on contextualized training in an anytime, anywhere form factor. Uh, context and embodiment are key to training these types of tasks in uh, stressful environments. Consider trying to save your buddy's life on the battlefield. That's a little bit different than applying a tourniquet in a classroom. So learning these things under stress, under dynamic situational factors, taxing environments, uh, visual and auditory confusion, and many other stressors can directly impact your operational performance in the field and AR supports the training of these psychomotor tasks under similar stress by providing anchors for visuomotor tasks 
and affording engagement with live equipment <clears throat> while viewing augmented uh, instruction. Now imagine training in a virtual environment while you're not feeling very well. There are some challenges to AR that come from uh, the physiological perspective. These include a couple of things, particularly the virgin's accommodation conflict, and on my next slide we'll talk about the field of view. So virgin's accommodation conflict occurs when the, when the <clears throat> adaptive lens of the human eye is forced to focus at a particular fixed depth. Um, <clears throat> our eyes are made to multifocus, and these, many of these AR displays only have a single depth plane, allow it, forcing our eyes to focus at one particular area. There, are, there may be some um, benefits to multiple depth plane technologies, like perhaps the Magic Leap 1 or maybe the new Magic Leap 2, as that's coming out soon. Um, and these, th but these things are certainly things that we need to take a look at and understand as we're designing for these types of immersive platforms. And the restricted field of view, obviously we, uh, most of us in the room probably know that AR has a significantly restricted field of view compared to the normal human vision. Um, normal humans see in 200 by 140, a HoloLens 1, for example, sees at about 30 by 17 and a half. A Magic Leap 1 is a little bit bigger at 40 by 30. And the HoloLens 2 is right or actually around there in the middle. So we didn't study the HoloLens 2 in this particular effort. That would be a new, um, a new thing that we would like to take a look at, the effects of those as we move the research forward. So for our current exploratory study, we had 60 participants of both genders. We used three AR devices, the um, <clears throat> Magic Leap one, the HoloLens one, and an AR-enabled Samsung tablet. Participants were exposed to two hours of TC3 training content in the headset or the tablet. And the dependent measures were the simulator sickness questionnaire, the, both the total scores and the ocul ocular motor subscale as well as a measure of postural instability, anterior posterior sway, as measured by the Tanberg, uh, hmm, tandem Romberg test. So let's talk about the results. Um, overall, <coughs> AR is very different from VR. Participants were well able to tolerate the full two hour sessions. We had zero dropouts and zero medic responses for those of you who don't know what a medic means, that's vomiting. Typically in VR, you see a, a, a very consistent 1% vomiting rate and about a 20% dropout rate due to disorientation. And we had absolutely none of those over three different studies, 450 participants, no dropouts. So the HoloLens 1 SSQ total score was the only of the three devices that actually fully dissipated after one, a one hour post exposure measurement. Both the AR tablet and the Magic Leap remained elevated, although it is important to note that all of them were in the low to moderate um, simulator sickness category, severity level. However, we did see large shifts in anterior posterior sway as, as seen in the HoloLens 1. On the graph at the bottom, you can see the HoloLens 1 had a 352% um, increase in postural instability immediately post-exposure, while the Magic Leap had a 19% increase and the tablet actually had a 12% decrease. So even though these particular results weren't statistically significant um, due to a, smaller, a much smaller than anticipated effect size and our um, therefore smaller sample size, um, they're still particularly concerning. Um, <clears throat> if, if this type of postural instability is associated with long duration exposure, that could have significant implications to human performance. Moving forward, it will be very important to continue quantifying the adverse effects using longer samples, um, varied exposure protocols, and additional objective measures. So to reiterate, prolonged AR, AR use of two hours appeared to be well tolerated, specifically in the HoloLens one, it seemed to be more, more well tolerated than either of the other two. 
Um, but due to physiological maladaptation, it's still recommended that postural stability be monitored post-exposure to ensure uh, patient, uh, not patient, trainee safety. So there, there is a bit of a conflict. So it's, it's well tolerated from a nauseogenic perspective. Um, so many, many may see this, the technology as safe for extended periods. However, that extended use is potentially um, problematic from a uh, <clears throat> posture standpoint. And so, of course, we would recommend usage protocols to ensure necessary soldier safety. So from a, a technical combat casualty care training perspective, um, we would consider implementing a dual use technology protocol. Um, use the AR tablets to deliver long duration declarative knowledge scenarios to supplement classroom and improve retention of basic uh, terminology facts, concepts, and procedures. Reserve the AR headworn displays for fully contextualized, embodied training um, scenarios, focusing on those hands-on procedural and conditional knowledge being it <clears throat> and having it linked to the context. These usage protocols um, are expected to reduce the post-exposure postural instability, although of course further uh, research is <clears throat> still needed. So, and, and our last recommendation to continue developing adaptive AR systems that can personalize that training experience based on trainees' proficiency, physiological well-being, and monitoring for some of these <coughs> physiological symptoms. Next. Questions? So we didn't see any effects beyond the first 15 minute um, after effect exposure. Um, so, that, so it went back to normal immediately post exposure. So after about 15 minutes, you seem to return to normal. Um, but in, the, in, you know, in a real world environment, that may be too long even. Uh, not in that particular study, no. As a matter of fact, I'll be presenting another paper tomorrow on the uh, learning, the learning effects of augmented reality. Yes. Did they, the experimental tasks, did they have to move around or they were Yes, it was a full um, t uh, TC3 CLS level um, training system. So they were actually getting down on a mannequin, putting on tourniquets, doing uh, needle chest decompressions, and walking through an entire um, casualty scenario. Did they go from one casualty to the other? Yeah, they, they, they repeated the, um, the scenarios until they got to the two hour mark. I think there was one over here. So, in thinking about the leading practitioners of TCCC, was there any, <coughs> or in your opinion, are there any interaction between the methods you use and the I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. So, were, were, the, were the subjects, first, like the first question, were the subjects time standard, or was there, you did the deep cut? They were not in this particular oh. study, no. So, the, this study used um, local um, uh, UCF students, Orlando residents, so very few, very few of these had had any prior TC3 knowledge. Um, so, no, they weren't, they weren't tasked to doing it correctly. Did you have to bring any outside data in when you were doing the study, or have you captured the data, and is there a repository somewhere? We captured all the data locally, um, and it is, it is um, <clears throat> secured in our secure facility. Um, if you're interested in some of the data set, you, can, you feel free to reach out to me, and I can get that to you. Is it, is it Department of Defense, or is it civilian? It was funded by DOD, so it was an MTech OTA. But absolutely, we're, we're more than willing to share the data. Sir? Uh, were there any uh, participant reports uh, throughout the study? Uh, I don't think I heard uh, eye strain mentioned or anything. Yes, so the, prim the, primary, um, <clears throat> the primary symptom from the SSQ, eye strain, headaches, and fatigue. 
So those things load typically on the ocular motor subscale. Um, so that's not something I mentioned in this particular um, presentation, but Dr. Stani will be doing a panel tomorrow um, at 1030. It's the, sorry, Research Foundations and Findings Supporting Augmented and Virtual Reality Implementation in the Wild. That's tomorrow at 1030. She'll be discussing quite a bit of, quite a number of these results as well. Um, I don't have the specific demographics in front of me, but it was fairly varied. We, we, um, we had a pretty good mix of genders. I think, I want to say 48% female. Um, I couldn't tell you on the corrective lenses, but we did have lots of them who, who did have. I can't give you a specific number. So certainly with VR, motion history, uh, motion sickness history factors in um, with virtual reality. We didn't see that happen with the augmented reality, um, but we still have a small sample size, so I, I, I don't have an answer for that specifically. I would imagine if it factors in with VR, possibly factors in with AR. Mm -hmm. Were any of your subjects military? Uh, very few. I think we had about... 15% military who are either um, ROTC students from UCF or former military. Sir? Was there any studies of like the long-term effects? Because I think this is just over a two-hour period. So yeah, the like post-exposure measurements went for an hour after the after. We didn't, we didn't go beyond that. Or like repeated use or repeated sessions? So we actually, that's not part of this particular presentation. We had a varied exposure protocols. So we had a straight protracted two hour exposure. We also had two other exposures, um, one with uh, three 40 minute sessions with 30 minute breaks between, and one with six 20 minute sessions with 30 minute breaks in between. And what we found is that, especially from a subjective perspective, how they were feeling, participants did better with a full straight protracted two hours than they did with breaks. We feel like it's because the breaks are actually too long. So you're in the headset, you're, you start getting used to the headset and then we pull you out, you start getting used to not being in and then we put you back in. We'd really like to run the study again with, um, and do shorter breaks, maybe five minutes. In the back. So uh, if I understand correctly, the postural instability was, was after they came out of the headset. Correct. And so, did, was there any, but there wasn't any postural instability during the performance of the task? We didn't like measure it during. We measured at, at prior to exposure and then measured the increase um, after exposure for 15 minute, in 15 minute increments for an hour. Okay. And then, um, was there any acclimatization period when they first went into the headset before they started the performance of the task? No. And then, was there any recovery period no. while they were still in the headsets after they? after their task performance before they came out of the headset? No. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Let's you.